Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you uh, for joining us today. My name is Ashley Studholm. I'm with the Prince William Conservation Alliance. And um, during the presentation, I'm going to put everybody on mute, but please feel free to use the chat feature uh, to put in your questions or comments or anything. And we'll circle back after uh, Larry's presentation at the end. Um, and before we get started, I just wanted to encourage you, where is it? Here we go. Uh, to let you all know that coming up in September, we are hosting, along with other uh, co-sponsor organizations, uh, Restoring the Little Things That Run the World with Doug Tallamy. That's on September 25th. And uh, I'll be putting details in that uh, for that talk in the follow-up email. And as always, you can find our, um, you go to our website at PW Conserve. You can discover all of our updates upcoming events and the various um, programs that we're running or um, um, issues that we're following. And you can come here to our calendar to stay up to date on that. And um, we host these um, programs uh, free of charge for anyone uh, because of the generosity of everyone, of our, of our donors. And if you would like to support what we do, you can click here, join us today and donate and support programs like this and um, as well as our other programs at Merrimack Farm and, and, and in other um, aspects to protect the natural areas here in Prince William County. And one thing that you can do is become um, a recurring donor and that just helps us um, know what's coming in even even better so have be a monthly sustainer would be great so um just wanted to point out that uh, but today we are here to dive in and learn more about butterflies of prince william and we are honored to have Larry Mead with us. He is the president of the Northern Virginia Bird Club and is on the Adult Education Committee for Audubon. He's a writer, a photographer. He leads outdoor nature trips, especially relating to birds. Um, he publishes videos and has even narrated a dance program. So he is quite the Renaissance man and we're, we're delighted to have him here with us today. And before I pass it over to Larry, I, there's one more thing I wanted to mention. And that is that um, next week, um, we will be hosting uh, the Butterfly Count with the, uh, the North American Butterfly Association. We're, we're hosting it here. And we do have a couple of spots available for if you're interested to volunteer, please reach out to me at alliance at pwconserve.org. That will also be in a follow-up email. And that will be next, that will be next Sunday, um, July 17th. Um, but with that, I will pass it on to Larry so we can dive in and get to know our local butterflies. Thank you so much, Larry, for being here today. Uh, you're welcome. Oh, and I want to mention, you don't have to be an expert to be on the count. You can be a rank beginner because uh, we'll put you with someone who knows all the butterflies. And it's a good way to learn. All right. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. Share. All right. Can you see that? Yes, sure. Okay, whoops. You sure can. Click there. It advances. Good. All right. Got all the tricks now. All right. So welcome to the butterflies of summer. You're looking at uh, the eastern tiger swallowtail. This is a female. Uh, I just like this picture. It's one of my favorites. It's a female. You can tell by the uh, blue on, on the bottom there. This is the state insect of Virginia. Did you know there was a state insect of Virginia? Well, this is it. So uh, Eastern Tiger Swallowtail, talk about them a little more. All right, um, not gonna be a quiz on this, but uh, some things I might mention. This is the anatomy of a butterfly. 
So uh, you can see, uh, you know, basic insect anatomy, abdomen, head, thorax. But uh, we also talk about uh, the antenna clubs. This is something specific to butterflies, which I'll talk about. We have a forewing, hind wing, and then we can have margins. We have cells sometimes. So there's uh, different things we talk about. And uh, you'll get the idea. So one thing people ask, you might ask yourself, self, what's the difference between a butterfly and a moth? And they are, they are actually technically Butterflies are day flying moths, but they are different families and there are differences. Uh, butterflies are usually in the daytime. Uh, there are moths that are flying the day also, but uh, not as often. And, and then I showed you that knob on the end of the butterfly uh, antenna. That's a uh, diagnostic. Moths don't have that. So if you see something that does not have the little knob, that's a moth. Um, also, uh, moths tend to have thicker, uh, fuzzier bodies, and uh, not always true, but usually um, the wings are held straight, and with moths, they're going to be kind of folded back. But some butterflies have that, and some moths have this. It's not an absolute thing, but it's a little rule of thumb. So let's get started on the butterflies. Oh, one thing, another thing I want to mention, uh, host plants. Host plants are what? the caterpillars eat. And if you have a butterfly guide or uh, I'll be on the website, most uh, butterflies are very picky about what host plants they eat. Of course, this is the most famous one, which is the uh, monarch caterpillar. Judy Gallagher is here. She is a, our regional expert on milkweed, basically. Uh, she studied a lot and uh, a lot of other things, but uh, They'll they'll eat they'll eat these. They'll go through instars, which is different growths they go through. They'll shed their skin, and eventually, when they reach their full size, that's when they'll go into their chrysalis and become adults. So, like I said, the butterflies have very specific uh, host plants, and that's what the caterpillars eat. And then nectar plants are what the adults eat. This is oh, by the way, everything in this program are my photos. Just to mention. To say. Um, this is one I took, I think, in Cape May, somewhere like that. This is coastal goldenrod, and the migrating monarchs just love it. You see, if you find coastal goldenrod in the fall, there's going to be usually monarch all over it. So that's what we mean by nectar plants. It's what the adults eat. And they're not as picky about that, although they do like certain flowers more than others. All right. So it's hard to be a butterfly. I mean, just like nature is hard. Can anybody see what's going on here? This is a common buckeye butterfly, and it's actually, this is a spider. This is called a crab spider, and it's eating the butterfly. It's got the butterfly by the head, and it's eating it. I thought this was so cool when I saw it. And look, it's the exact same color as the flower. So these are ambush predators. They'll find a flower and it takes them a week maybe or so to become the exact color of the flower they're sitting on. And then when a butterfly comes in, yeah, they have no idea there's a spider there. So uh, they don't necessarily have an idyllic life all the time. So let's get into some of the species. I mentioned the Eastern tiger swallowtail, which is our state insect. So uh, there is a yellow form and there's black form. And obviously called a tiger because of the stripes. Uh, the one on the left is a male. It does not have all the blue under down on the lower uh, part as I showed you the first slide. The one on the right is actually also a female. All of the black morph swallowtails are females. And the reason there's a black morph is because they are uh, basically mimicking pipevine swallowtails which is a uh, species of butterfly that birds don't like at all. So this is a tiger and a few field marks to tell. Um, the body does not have any spots on it. The other black swallowtails that we'll talk about do have spots on the body. Also, you can see here, um, the wings are translucent and you can actually see stripes there 
kind of vestigial in the wings. So you're going to see a, 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 a no spots on the body, translucent wings, and you can often in the right light see those stripes there. Okay. Here's another photo of a tiger small tail. That's the yellow morph. I just like this picture. And then, uh, all right, so here's another swallowtail. This is the spice bush swallowtail. You can see on the left, you can see the spice bush. That's a hummingbird moth. So that is a kind of uh, day flying moth there. But the key thing to look for here, okay, it does have the spots in the body that you can see. But the thing here is they have this orange spot band here, and it's interrupted by this blue rocket. See that? And that's usually pretty easy to see. Uh, when it's in this in this pose, and they often are in this pose. So look for the orange spot band, look for the blue rocket, and that's going to be a spice bush swallowtail. And it is named spice bush because that's the host plant. Um, and you can see on the left, it's uh, on thistle. Butterflies love thistle. So if you're doing a butterfly count, if you see thistle, it's really good to check it out, see if there's anything on it, because often there is. So that's that one. Here's another one. This is the black swallowtail. This one can be a little trickier. Um, the males are fairly easy to tell because they have uh, the two rows of yellow stripes. See, lots of uh, yellow dots. It's just, just two, two really, really, really distinctive rows. And then and they're, they're a little smaller too, I find. That's the male. And the female's a little trickier, but uh, you might have to look twice, though they have the blue. Um, from above, they're, they're pretty similar to a spice bush, so you really need to study it, try to get a photo. But uh, they're, they're going to they're be a little smaller than a spice bush. And the, the shape of the spots is different, too. If you have a butterfly field goal, you'll see that. So here's another one. This is the one I mentioned, the pipe vine swallowtail. They, um, they are the ones that are distasteful to birds, and that's why we have so many black swallowtails is because the other butterflies are mimicking these. And this one is not too hard to ID. You can see all this blue on top, it's just beautiful. This one's got a little bite out of it, but beautiful blue. And then when you see them in this pose, these huge orange spots here, very distinctive. And this is a pretty one. This one is a little more uncommon than the other ones, I would say. So that's pipe vine. And there's another shot of a pipe vine. So this one, you can see the big spots and the blue. Okay. And this one's probably the easiest one, the zebra swallowtail, right? Um, this is one from late summer. The later uh, butterflies are going to be bigger because uh, I mentioned the instars, because it's been hot all summer. Uh, the caterpillars have had more time to uh, eat and get warm and gain energy and then so when they become butterflies they're going to be bigger than the early season ones so uh the early season tiger uh zebras are not going to have such long tails usually so that's that that one's easy sometimes i ask kids why do you think it's a zebra well it's black and white that's easy all right now here's our friendly monarch all right monarchs are coming in um see I, I've, I've seen them since may around in fact, uh, we did a survey at Meadowood, I think, in May, and I had like, uh, well, it would have been mid mid June. It was. I saw five or six of them, and then you have the one on the right is the viceroy, and if you can see the difference between them, viceroys have this extra band, extra band here, extra line bisecting the different cells, which the monarch doesn't have. Also, viceroys are slightly smaller, and I find the flight is different. That's another thing when you're identifying butterflies is check out how they fly. Monarchs tend to be more fluttery, whereas a viceroy tends to have more of a direct flight. So these are both around here. Monarchs are going to be more common than viceroys usually. So, but really, what you want to look for is this extra black line here. And you can see that on the top and the bottom of the butterfly. Okay. Here we have a female and male. Actually, yeah. Males, you can tell 
male monarchs have this extra spot here. I think that's a, yeah, that's a female on the right. Extra spot here, that's a gland. That's like a uh, hormone, hormone gland. So that is one way. Often you can't tell the difference between the sexes in uh, butterflies, monarchs. You can if you manage to see that little spot. So also the pattern, the wings are a little bit different too, the cells. So we talk about um, monarchs, the famous monarch migration. They obviously winter in Mexico and then they move up here in stages. And uh, th this is the, uh, and then they all go back to Mexico. And uh, you know they'll fly all the way from Canada, all the way back to Mexico in one shot. It's pretty amazing. And uh, they're, they, they really are dependent on, on weather. I think the, the population really crashed uh, maybe 10 years ago. There was a huge drought in Texas, in Oklahoma, which is right where they went through. I think a lot of them died of thirst trying to get down there. Um, but there's also uh, populations in California and Florida, which are always there. So, and, but the uh, California ones do migrate up and down the coast here. Florida ones are a little strange. They're kind of a sink. You can get, they have their own monarchs, but other monarchs from the rest of the country, there was a study recently found that uh, monarchs from all over the country, or, or much of the East Coast at least, were in Florida. So a lot of them kind of wandered down there and joined the population. It's kind of interesting. But I don't think they really leave Florida. It's hard to know. It's still being studied. So uh, that's uh, probably our most famous butterfly, right? The monarchs. All right, here's, a, here's one I saw in Cape May. They actually tag the monarchs. So you can see they uh, caught this guy and they put a tag on him. And uh, hopefully they'll recapture it somewhere. Ho hopefully it uh, gets to Mexico. That's, the, that's what they hope for. They actually pay uh, kids down there, and I guess other people, to find the tags uh, on the wintering grounds. And then they can uh, trace back where they all came from. So pretty cool. And that tag doesn't bother them. It's just on the wing. All right. So here's some more uh, butterflies we have. This is the painted lady. Painted ladies, uh, you might have raised these in elementary school, possibly. These guys uh, are uh, later in the season, the more of these you get. You get a lot of them in the fall because they'll come up from the south. So they'll kind of wander up here. Uh, we'll get a few right now, but not as many as later in the year. This is, okay, this is the way to tell the difference. Best way, I think, between the Painted Lady and the American Lady, which are very similar, you just count, you look at the spots here. So you got four small spots. The American Lady has two big spots. There are subtle differences here, but really, really, I find when you're identifying birds or butterflies or anything, if you have like a field mark that works for you, that's what you want to home in on, hone in on. So for me, I think for a lot of people, just looking at these spots, the two big spots, the four small spots, really a good way to tell these two apart. And American ladies tend to be more of an early season uh, butterfly. Uh, they're still around now too, but I see them uh, in April often, April and early May even. So... All right, here's another one. This one's related. This is a red admiral. Check out the big difference between the uh, top of the wings and the bottom of the wings. So this is when he's displaying. And this one, it's, I mean, that's really good camouflage. If, you, if the butterfly wants to hide, it can be camouflaged when it's got its wings closed. So huge, huge difference. Here's another popular butterfly. This one's a pretty big one. The great spangled fritillary. Sounds pretty exciting. They're great and they're spangled. So uh, best way to tell these guys, they are pretty big, but these big white spots here on the bottom of the wings, that's really, uh, really pretty easy to see. And then this pattern here, but really when they close their wings, this is really distinctive. That's, that's a field mark I like. Huh. And here's another one. This is the variegated fritillary. And they will often sit with their uh, wings out like this. This one is a different pattern than the uh, Great Spangled. 
Um, this one has this really uh, distinctive uh, pale band here between the two dark areas. See, the, the back hair is dark, this area is dark orange, and then you have this really distinctive pattern here. And uh, those are those are these are pretty easy to ID once you once you get the uh, get used to seeing that and paying attention to that. So this this really the contrast really stands out in the field. Okay, meadow fritillary. This one's a little more rare. Again, looks very different. See, there it's a variegated. This one does not have that that pattern. This is more of a two tone, right? So it's darker here, and then it's and then it's got all these little spots here. These are going to be a smaller. Uh, butterfly. Also, they will be in meadows, as their name implies. That's another thing to think about when you're identifying butterflies or birds or anything is what habitat are they in? I mean, are they in a wet area? Are they in your, you know, in your garden? Where would they be? Uh, meadow fritillary would not be as likely to be in your garden. I guess it's possible if you live near a field, maybe. But uh, they're they're going to be. Uh, we, we get them at the Manassas Battlefield is where I'm going to be. So uh, sometimes a lot of Sky Meadows, there's a lot of them. So a lot of these you just kind of kind of have to, it's good to take a photo if you're not sure, and then uh, check your field guide later or ask someone else who knows. Here's another one. This is one of my favorite butterflies, the Hackberry Emperor. You can see the top and bottom. These uh, these guys they do uh, host on hackberry trees, so you know, if you see hackberry trees, you might uh, look for hackberry emperors there. But the reason I like these, they're pretty, but also they really like people. They like the salt on you. So uh, I was uh, doing a butterfly count out in Loudoun County. It was really really hot, and uh, I was sweating. And my hat was sweaty. This hackberry emperor came in and landed on my hat. And he stayed there for, I, we, we timed it. He, he was there for 20 minutes riding my hat. So, and you can see here, he's up here uh, on someone's sandal going after the uh, salt on their toe, I guess. So uh, very friendly butterflies, right? Here's another one. This is what we call um, angle wings. You can see they have this sort of angular wings here. This one is an Eastern comma, and it's called that because if you look here, this is the uh, underside version. Looks like a dead leaf, doesn't it? This, these, it's great camouflage. I think this was at Merrimack Farm. I just happened to spot it. And uh, see, it looks sort of like a comma here. That's why it's called a comma. And if you look up here, there's three spots, one, two, three, and the comma, as opposed to this butterfly, the question mark. And if you look on the right, again, it looks like a dead leaf, but it's got this extra little spot here, little dot. So that's why they call it a question mark. And this one has this extra spot right here. So one, two, three, four spots, as opposed to the uh, comma, which on, then it did not have this extra little bar here. So that's the way you tell them apart. Um, on the wing, it's pretty difficult. <laughs> Generally, you have to, they have to land for you to really ID these guys. So from the top, you're going to look here at these spots. From the bottom, you'll look for the extra little uh, period there, right? Okay. Question mark. And then there's the extremely rare exclamation mark, but I've never seen that. No, I'm kidding. I, I just made that up. <laughs> anyway, here's uh, one of my favorites. This is the common buckeye. Um, I guess there's a lot of these in Ohio. I don't know. But uh, beautiful big spots. I don't know if I, maybe the birds think these are eyes. So they veer away or something. I'm not sure. But uh, those are very common around here. Okay. So this is the red spot of purple. It's called that because it's purple and it's got red spots. But these are, uh, they don't have a tail though, right? So that's the way you tell them apart from a uh, uh, a swallowtail, obviously, no tails, right? And uh, they're gonna be, tend to be hanging out near woods usually. So kind of on the edge of woods is where I usually see them. And they're pretty common. There actually is a uh, another species up north like Maine 
called the white admiral, which is actually considered the same species, but they look so different. I think, I don't know, I, I, I make them different, so whatever. But uh, yeah, they you know, get the orange spots, very pretty butterfly. Okay, this is our cabbage whites. We see these a lot. They're actually not even native, but you can see them here. They're uh, on this uh, charcoal here. They're actually eat, uh, eating minerals. This is uh, some charcoal that someone dumped. So uh, often, often butterflies will do that. You'll see them in, in dirt or uh, otherwise trying to get minerals. So cabbage whites, they have the spot on the wings. You can see that. As opposed to these, these are the sulfurs. We have clouded sulfurs and orange sulfurs. Um, usually with some experience, you can tell these apart. Clouded sulfurs tend to be um, lemony yellow. It's a medium sized butterfly. Whereas orange sulfurs have, well, they're a little darker. They have some orange on them. So if they have any orange at all on them, it's probably, it's gonna be an orange sulfur. So again, take some experience to tell them apart, but uh, good to get photos if you don't know. But I just, just when I see a cloud, it's just really, really light yellow. It's, it's, it's... And of course, just to confuse things, <laughs> sometimes you get a white sulfur. So these are also clouded sulfurs, but you can see one of them is white. So sometimes when you see a white butterfly, it might not be a cabbage white, could be a white clouded sulfur or orange sulfur. So uh, just to make things more confusing, right? So I uh, just look at it carefully, look for the little spot on the wings. Um, the, the sulfurs will have the small spot. It won't have the big black spot like the, the uh, cabbage white did. So they do look a little different, okay? And here's one of our favorites. This is the sleepy orange host on sedge plants. So if you see a lot of sedge plants, you probably get some sleepy orange. They're about the same size as the sulfurs, but they uh, don't have the spot. They have kind of these little uh, markings here, almost like almost like somebody scribbled there. And uh, when they fly, they look very, I don't have one uh, from above because they almost always perch like this, but it's gonna be a very, very uh, dark orange. And uh, they fly quickly too, which is, I always thought was ironic. They're called a sleepy orange, but they uh, fly very quickly. So if you see a little orange, uh, very kind of bright orange butterfly flying quickly, that could well be a sleepy orange. So here's a couple, these are two that get confused. I even sometimes uh, get a little confused with them uh, if they don't see it. Well, this is the pearl crescent and the silvery checker spot. They're obviously very similar looking. Um, so every checker spot tends to be a little larger. By the way, these pearl crescents are very common. So every checker spots are not as common, but they're pretty common. And the pearl crescents often, you'll see them in grass a lot. But uh, the main difference is if you look above here, the silver spots here, see these, which this guy does not have. And then also again, like the variegated frillary, it's got this, uh, border of this, this very light yellow border here between these two areas. But really the thing to home in for me is, is looking for these silver spots. So again, okay, I have a good field guide, it'll help you. All right, here's a couple of our blue butterflies. This is the Eastern tail blue, or as we say in butterfly jargon, ETB. You can see um, these are going to be smaller and they'll usually only uh, stay at about your ankles or maybe your knees at most. So that is one thing. And also, if you see them well, they have these little tails here and they'll have a little uh, orange spot here. Whereas the Azure do not have the little tails, they're a little larger and they'll fly higher. Often see Azures on the edge of woods. Um, basically, we have two species in our area of azures. All the ones right now are going to be summer azures. In the spring, there are a few spring azures, but even then, the research that's been done lately by Harry Pavillon and others uh, has shown that 
the vast majority of azures in the spring are also summer azures. They're just the spring form. So still a little controversial, but anyway, you can pretty comfortably call everything right now a summer azure. So, and we got the hair streaks. Um, oh, I was gonna mention, why, why do they have these tails? Hair streaks like the ETBs have these little tails and, and then, and then they, these hair streaks also have an eye. So I think what it is, is the birds will think this is actually their head. So uh, they'll come in and they think it's the head. They'll get confused and then the butterfly can, or they might bite this part and the butterfly can get away. Because butterflies can live with uh, poles in their wings. It's fine. So as long as I can fly. So I think, I think that's why they have it. So this is the gray. This is probably your most common hair streak, the gray hair streak. Juniper hair streak, uh, pretty common uh, in the garden behind uh, at Merrimack Farm. Uh, often I've seen a lot. I think that's probably where I photographed this one. So uh, they're very cool. They're green. One of the few green butterflies. So uh, other hair streak. This is another really pretty one. The red banded hair streak. Again, it's got the little tails and little eye there. Big red bands. Okay. This is the American copper. Uh, this one is more rare, but you might see one. They, uh, they're often in grass or on a flower in meadows. I find them in meadows usually. Very pretty. Get this grayish and the different reds. It's very beautiful butterfly. Here's another one. The comp now we have some uh, kind of woods butterflies, which tend to be brown because they're uh, trying to camouflage in the woods. This is the common wood nymph, which is fairly large. It's got this big pale, pale area on its wing, pretty diagnostic. And they're common, very common in Aquan Bay. Uh, here's some other ones. We have the little wood satyr and the northern pearl eye. Again, more uh, difference in the spot patterns. These are smaller and they'll have, you can see the spot pattern. Pearl eyes often will perch like this on the side of trees. They have the big spot here, surrounded, uh, kind of pale here with these very distinctive uh, lines. We've got, all right, so those are those two. There's, I'm not doing every butterfly we have, by the way. There's others too, which would be on your field guides. Um, all right, now we'll talk about some skippers. Skippers are also butterflies. They're kind of a different family though. So they're gonna look and act a little differently. This is the easiest skipper to identify, the silver spotted skipper. It's bigger than most of the other skippers and it's got this big white spot on it. So that one is uh, not a problem. Now this one's a little trickier. This is the Zabulon skipper. Again, a very common skipper. You're gonna find it on the edge of woods oftentimes. So above and below. So you can see the skipper. He sits almost like a little jet fighter. Doesn't stretch his wings out as much as a butter, the, the other butterfly, regular butterflies do. So they'll, they'll sit like this or they'll sit uh, this way. So this way you can see this big orange patch here surrounded by thick brown border here, black and dark brown, black border. And when he's perched like this, you can see very diagnostic, this orange area here surrounded by brown. So that's a Zabulon skipper. And again, they do have the big clubs, say like all butterflies do. Yeah. Here's some others. These are our dusky wings. They'll often sit out flat. They don't sit with their wings folded like the Zabulon did. So the horses, uh, again, these can be kind of tricky, but Horses will have, uh, there isn't one called the juveniles, but they're gone. Uh, some butterflies only fly in the early spring. So I'm only talking about the ones we'll see this time of year right now. So they're, they're, it's subtle, but they have this extra little spot here. Uh, that's one way to tell them apart. The wild indigo doesn't have that. And wild indigos can be, the males are very dark. So again, Good to get a photo and check your butterfly guide. So this is a little tricky. Here's one that's pretty easy to tell. This is the common checkered skipper. 
I uh, usually see a few of those. These are not that common, but uh, they're again going to be in fields usually. Here's a couple more skippers we could get. Least skippers. They're very small. That's kind of the best field mark for them. Very, very small. And they do have uh, their orange out of the. And the fiery skippers are a little larger than the least skippers. They have this sort of uh, almost like leopard spots here. And they're this pale orange. So they're called fiery skippers. And they are more of a late season species. Uh, a lot of them in the fall, late summer. Fall. But we, we, we could well get some uh, this month too. Okay, here's the most common skipper, probably the sachem. Sachems, uh, if you see them from above, this is called a stigma. They have this big, dark rectangle here. Very, very distinctive, very obvious. And even here, with it's got its wings folded, you can even see it here uh, from this angle. So uh, that's, that's going to be very common. So it's like, I'm sometimes doing a count, and I go in like, Sachem, 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 two more Sachems. <laughs> but uh, hey, um, and they can be very uh, highly variable, but often they'll have these sort of spots here. And so again, got to use your butterfly guide sometimes. Unless you see it from above, then you'll probably see the, the big black rectangle there, right? Okay, a couple more you could get the peck skipper. Peck's got checks. It's got very distinctive check, checkered pattern here. So that's a good, good little rhyme. Um, the glassy wing, also fairly common skipper. Uh, they're going to be, they have a spot band here. So we'll call this a spot band. And they're kind of, see, they have kind of a almost purplish hue there. But another good thing, if you have a good photo of it, right at the base of the palps, there's going to be of these knobs, we call these palps sometimes, it's white, there's, there's white, you can see it here pretty well, right in front of the tongue, behind the tongue. Uh, so if you see that, and you see kind of a purplish sheen, that's a little glass zooming. Again, skippers can be very, very, uh, especially if they're worn, or the different sexes, they can be pretty complicated. So that's off the fun though, right? The end of the counts, we'll go over our skipper photos and <laughs> see what everyone thinks they are. So uh, it's gonna be, but uh, give you some little tips here. All right, well, thank you. This is another uh, red spotted purple. And you can see uh, the light shining through. So that's all I got. That's great, Larry, thanks so much. Um, I actually, I didn't know that the uh, Eastern Tiger Swallowtail was the state insect. So that was- Well, there you go. Cool. Cool to learn. And that photo of the the spider, the yellow spider, was phenomenal. Um, so that's great. If Does anyone have any questions or comments? Oh, thanks, David. Yeah, years of, years of uh, butterflying. <laughs> yeah. I actually yeah. have one comment, and that is that, uh, you know, those tails on the hair streaks? Yes. Um, recent research has shown that it actually is more useful in repelling jumping spiders. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Very cool. So it's part of their defense. Yeah. So it doesn't really, it's really not against birds as much? No. Okay. All right. Good. See, we're always learning. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. Kitty, come on in. Uh, thank you. So being late, I... <clears throat> probably missed this, but is there a specific guide that you recommend? Specific guide to both. Oh, yes. Oh, I was going to mention that. Why, yes, now that you mention it. <laughs> <laughs> this is Judy's who just spoke. This is uh, Butterflies of Northern Virginia, of the Mid Atlantic. Butterflies of the Mid Atlantic, which is the new one. Butterflies of Mid Atlantic by Judy Gallagher and Bob Blakeney. This is excellent, Judy autographed mine. So uh, you can see uh, very, very beautiful pictures. And these are all ones that you'll see locally. And it tells you all the host plants, these uh, months you can see them. So I highly recommend that. Um, if you wanna go uh, for the whole national area, I would go with uh, this one. This is the uh, Kaufman Field Guide. 
uh, Butterflies of North America. And this one is sort of set up like the Sibley Guide. You can see there's uh, maps and uh, life. They'll show you the life size pictures. So, uh, and then you can also keep your uh, life list in the back. So, those are the two I mostly use. Thank Do you. you have recommendations as to where you might pick those up? Uh, they're all on Amazon, right? Judy? Judy, where can we get your book? Uh, definitely on Amazon. Um, the Conservation Alliance might have some too. Is that so, Ashley? Or yeah, I'm. I'm pretty sure we have a couple more copies, and we we also have um, just a, a booklet of common butterflies of Prince William County too. So feel free to stop by and say hello and see our butterfly books. Um, let's see. I think I saw a question in the chat, and that was. Grant, do you want to come on in? It's about monarchs. Well, I was just curious, since we talk about them migrating, that tends to make you think they must live longer than a, a couple months or a summer. So how, how long do they live? Depends on which generation they are. So uh, the ones uh, that are born in the South, they, they'll just live a few months and then they'll come up and then... Uh, I don't remember, forget how, I, maybe for three generations, and then and then and then in the uh, late summer uh, or uh, September, we'll have what we call the super generation, and they're the ones that will migrate to uh, Mexico, and they don't become uh, their hormones aren't don't click on, so that's why they can live longer, and they'll uh, fatten up, and then they they can live. How long is it, Judy? When they uh, from when they mig from when they take flight. And then uh, come back at the end of the winter. So probably they, about six to eight months. Yeah, six to eight months, the super generation. And then once they get to Texas, uh, after flying out of Mexico, they'll lay eggs in and die soon after that. And then their babies will keep moving up, moving out, spreading out throughout the East Coast. But uh, some of them seem to fly further, because I see them in May. I saw... So uh, I think you have some uh, kind of moving ahead of the other the other cohort, more or less. Does that answer your question? Uh, sure. Um, so I guess they don't live that long, but they live long enough to migrate, and then they come. They start coming back, lay eggs, and then they die. Yeah, the six to eight, the super ones, like I say, it's like Jesus, six to eight months or so. So uh, most, most butterflies only live a season. Not even. Maybe maybe a month or two, right. depending. Yeah, right. Depending on the species. Yeah, you can be between broods. Um, like uh, a couple of weeks ago, there were hardly any tiger swallowtails, but now they're come out, and I think all the ones from the spring have died off. So, then the, now they're coming back well. So I've seen a lot lately. So it's like the next brood. So. Yeah, that's interesting. Terry, did you want to pop in and share your comment? Yeah, I was just commenting that I have not seen the volume of butterflies that I in Southern Maryland that we had years ago. Um, it's a little discouraging. I mean, today I just happened to see for the first time a, um, well, actually second time for monarch and first time for seeing a zebra swallowtail in my yard. But I mean, they just seem so sparse. Well, are you just talking about your yard or are you going yeah. to parks too? No, pretty much in my yard, which I okay. have a lot of native plants. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, no, they were there. They were, well, I'm more in the park, so I see quite a few. But uh, they were, uh, there were quite a few in April, I think. And then uh, the weather was really terrible. It got really cold and rainy for quite a while in the spring. And I think that may have uh, really repressed them. So yeah, in June, there were not many at all. Because And I think they're starting to recover pretty well now. So I think, I think they're on the comeback. Uh, I was out the other day. I saw a good fair number. But uh, they'll keep ramping up through the season. Hopefully in a week from now, there'll be more. So uh, hopefully they'll come to your yard too. So, but I think yeah, it does give it seem time. though that the uh, the insect populations just generally are on a decline. Insects in general are declining. That is true. 
So mm -hmm. it might be a function of that too. Well, yeah. my observation is springtime, you'll have a lot more butterflies. This time of year, not so much. And then September and October uh, is a really good time for butterflies. Yeah, August, early August, I think late July, August can be good too. We get a ton out in the loud. Um, oh, I want to mention also uh, just another plug. So in addition to this butterfly count uh, in a week, uh, I'm also the compiler for another butterfly count, which is the Alexandria Circle, which we're doing uh, in September, September 17th. So two months. So uh, we just started started that last year. So let's still uh, getting it, making, making it better every year. So. Mm -hmm. So, Terry, it seems like you might be observing a couple of uh, cycles of, you know, just kind of a natural lull in the population, as well as just a general um, trend of, of the decline in, in insect species yeah. just generally. Yeah, I think in a, I think in a few weeks, you'll, you'll get a lot more. Yeah. yeah, I would just like to make one comment on um, the scarceness, and that is that by doing um, annual butterfly counts like this, we're getting a lot of data that helps to, you know, track trends. So um, kudos to the Conservation Alliance and to Larry um, for doing this. Oh, thanks, Judy. Yeah, thanks. Judy's right. This this is citizen science. This is done with the uh, National Association, National but North American Butterfly Association. There we go. And uh, scientists really do use the data by these circles. They're done all over the country. They're done uh, yearly. And there's a lot of them. It's like the Christmas bird counts, uh, the same thing. So uh, this, this is useful data because uh, the scientists cannot get out themselves and survey all these places that, that we go to. So, uh, yeah, you're doing exactly. your part. Exactly. We're playing an important role in, in that data collection, uh, certainly. And as Larry mentioned, um, the data that we collect during these surveys are reported to a national database, which is then used by scientists. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Judy. Um, Grant was asking about an app. Uh, you can use uh, iNaturalist. And what's the other one? Seek, is it called? an app to uh, identify things? Yeah, I've tried using those, but when you take a picture of a caterpillar and then you ask iNaturalist to identify it, it just brings up a bunch of moths or, or butterflies. Right. It doesn't seem to show you the actual caterpillar to identify what it is. So then you're having to try to figure out, okay, well, which caterpillar which caterpillar is this particular, I mean, which moth or butterfly is this particular caterpillar? Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess you could always just go Google Google uh, the caterpillars and get an image of it. I think that's what I did. Uh, I had a caterpillar. I didn't know what it was. And I naturally said, Luna moth. So I said, okay. So I went to uh, Google Luna moth caterpillar, and that's what it was. So. Judy, do you have any other recommendations? We had a good talk about some of the limitations with iNaturalist. I don't know if yeah. you have any additional insights. I don't. I mean, one of the problems with caterpillars is that although there's a finite number of butterfly species around here, um, the moth population is pretty <laughs> wide, you know, the, yeah. uh, and the way iNaturalist um, works in terms of their um, their artificial intelligence is you have to have a certain number of research grade observations of a caterpillar to even have it in there. So there's probably several hundred moths around here that aren't part of iNaturalist AI. Um, so I sympathize with that. I, there is a really good book by David Wagner, um, Caterpillars of the East Coast or Eastern North America or something like that. Um, that I would highly recommend, but it doesn't have all of them in there either. And then caterpillars, like so many things, have different instars, which is different forms, you know, between when they shed their skins to grow a little bit more. And they sometimes look different between instars. So caterpillars are really hard. I, I sympathize with you, Grant. I have trouble <laughs> IDing them too. 
Yeah. And if Judy has trouble, <laughs> there's not much hope, hope for yeah, the rest of us. <laughs> uh, I think I just got lucky with the Luna because uh, it looked just like it. So. Right. There's some of the caterpillars that are a little bit more um, noted, like the right. Luna or Cobra. the Monarch or, or some of those, uh -huh. those others. Uh -huh. um, I'll include the uh, guides that we've mentioned in the follow-up email so you don't have to remember everything. But thanks, Judy, for the addition of the, the caterpillars of the East Coast. I'll include that as well. Uh, okay. I will say one more thing about iNaturalist, though. The butterfly caterpillars would probably all be in the AI because they're, well, with the possible exception of some of the hair streaks, which are pretty small. But uh, I think any caterpillar you're likely to see that is a um, butterfly would probably be ID'd relatively um, successfully by iNaturalist. And there's just not as many butterflies and people photograph them a lot more, so right but uh yeah there's so many moths so, you know. <laughs> yep that's that's a good point any other observations or questions or things anybody have point? questions about butterfly counts or anything i have a question for you ashley um well for any anyone can we still invite people to join the the butterfly count yeah, just uh, let me let me know or send them my way, and and I'll uh, I'll get them up to speed. Okay. And are you going to send um, the link to the recording for today to us? Yep. Yep. I sure will. I'll upload that and get everyone um, the link to the YouTube video. So if you did happen to come in a little bit late or there was an interruption or any of that, you will have that as a reference. Right. Excellent. Thank you. You can watch my uh, dragonfly show on there too, apparently. So. <laughs> Which is our most viewed on our YouTube channel. So you can go over there and, and check out. We have a playlist of some uh, celebrating some of the nearby nature. And, and Larry did a phenomenal presentation on dragonflies and, dam and damselflies. And it's one of our most viewed. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I Any hope other? you all see some butterflies out there. So, and um, yeah, just to you know, I mean, Larry mentioned host plants and um, and nectaring plants, and there's that that strong relationship between native plants and insects, and that's certainly seen in butterflies. And so Terry mentioned that she has planted a bunch of native species in her garden, which is phenomenal. And so the more native plants that we have in our area, the more diversity of um, butterflies that we will have too, which you know is the foundation, especially the caterpillars. I mean that that just is wonderful food for so many other um, uh, animals such as birds and everything else. So um, everything is that we're sharing here is kind of it fits into the the food web um, that really supports our ecosystem uh, where we where we live. So um, I just wanted to end on that note. And again, uh, if there is anyone interested here that would like to participate in our annual butterfly count that is next Sunday, please reach out to me and uh, we'll get you all set up. But if there's any more I was, comments. I was gonna, if you have any uh, photos of anything you want to ID and uh, you're not sure, you can send it to me or through Ashley to me and uh, we'll try to figure it out. That's great. So I'll include Larry's email address also in the follow-up so we can um, share our photos and, and all become better um, butterfly identifiers, um, which would be phenomenal. And Larry, that was a phenomenal presentation as always. Thank you Thanks. so much. Thanks. <laughs> and thank you all for joining.